piece is called And the House Stares Back. Can you all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> this is a true story. There is a small brick house built in 1927 that sits on Alloway Place. Newlyweds bought it in the 50s, and since then, no one has ever moved out. She died young, and her goat, there's no pockets in these pants. <laughs> she died young, and her ghost is mostly gone now, save a glimpse of Eisenhower pink that peers through layers of flaking paint. The man, Joe, married my great Aunt Edna in the 1980s and died in the early aughts. His spirit is cursed to hold parts of the home together with his shoddy, arrogant DIY repairs. When Aunt Edna died, she left the home to me, and of course, she's here too, staring through the mirror of a mahogany vanity. When I first moved in a decade ago, it took me months to work up the courage to descend the exterior steps into the cellar below. I followed a wobbly metal railing below the earth to a pale warped door. The hinges yawned and groaned, and the belly of the house coughed up splinters and cobwebs and a few mummified camel crickets. A dull fluorescent light shuddered, strobing shadows through ribs of boxes, but did little to illuminate the catacombs of Christmas decorations and photo albums. I rounded a tower of memories and saw, bolted to the wall, a large metal meat grinder. Fuck this. <laughs> and left in a plume of dust. That was the second scariest thing I ever saw in that cellar. The house on Alloway has had many names. Annette's house, Hungry House, Teeter's house, Moon Pie's house. But for five years of recent history, during which it suffered abuse and neglect it would not soon forget, the house was simply called the farm. My ex was an artist, I was essentially his sidekick, and the farm was his, our, center of operations. The farm was a wood shop, a screen printing studio, an office, but it wasn't much of a home. I remember sleeping on a couch covered in sawdust because shelves of paintings, coated in noxious, drying epoxy, had taken over my bedroom. In the room that had once been called The Den, a cozy place for Wheel of Fortune and unfinished crossword puzzles, I would stand in the clammy darkness of the now screen printing room, pressure washing, while mineral spirits leaked at my feet, making scars and boils in the linoleum. Paint splattered the floor and grasped in permanent handprints on every door. The house was unrecognizable, and so was I. When a young codependent pushover dates an old manipulative narcissist, you tell a story so cliche I'm embarrassed to be its protagonist. His passions became my passions, his life became my life. When bits of autonomy would squeak out of me, they were met with accusations of selfishness. Jason had conquered so much of the house, my house, that when we blessedly broke up, it was easier for me to move out. Everything I owned could fit into my car. I drove across the country and started a new life, and for the first time, I charged him rent. Six months later, I asked him to move out and returned once again to Atlanta. I came back to a house diseased with disrepair. Trash was the carpet and grime was the wallpaper. The shower had a large gaping hole in the wall where apparently when the plumbing had malfunctioned, he had ripped off the tile, sighed off the plaster, but never sealed it back up, leaving a wound vulnerable to mildew and rot. And then there was the cellar. In the cellar, a soft static filled the air. It was the sound when you hold your ear to a freshly poured glass of cola, the sound of heavy snow in a quiet place. Thousands of tiny bodies hitting the ground, one after another, after another, after another. I looked down. Legions of fleas were streaming up my ankles. I wouldn't have known whether to call an exterminator or a priest, but I couldn't afford either. <laughs> I naively bought bug bombs at Kroger. They come in packs of three. The instructions say, do not use more than one bomb per room, but the law dissolves in chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and I activated the trinity of pesticides. <laughs> I left the house for two hours. I went to the farmer's market. <laughs> I bought a watermelon and felt the June sun and was filled with heartbreaking optimism. 
When I returned, I stood in the cursed cellar in my favorite Chuck Taylors. A single flea appeared on my ankle, and when I bent over to squish its plump abdomen between my thumb and forefinger, I saw a mouse from the shiny bodies bushwhacking their way through my laces. My soul turned to iron. Who was I kidding? This was Stephen King, not R.L. Stein. <laughs> Within minutes, my sneakers were in the garbage, and I found a place that would sell me professional grades pesticides. That night, my body crawled with phantom fleas. But every time I checked for them, all I would find was clean, goose-pimpled flesh. My dog let out a stuttering snore, and I opened my eyes to see a black dot mazing its way through her neck fur, four inches from my face. Clad in masks, goggles, and galoshes, I misted chemicals onto every surface of the cellar until beads of poison dripped down the walls. After another squirmy night's unrest, I returned to vacuum. Upon entering the cellar, skeptic fear turned into schadenfreudic glee. There was no more static, no more legions, only silence. The floor was littered with slaughtered exoskeletons, roaches, moths, beetles, centipedes. I cried no tears for these casualties. <laughs> A circlet of red welts girded my ankles. I was marked. I was forever changed. Near the door, a dead ladybug sparkled like candy in the sunlight. How strange that humans show affection, seemingly arbitrarily, for some creatures more than others. I sucked her car space up with the shot back. <laughs> Cellar cleansed. The animals came next. Moon pie. The dog had one or two, the short-haired cat was clean. Samantha, a cat so fluffy she looks like a ball of dryer lint cursed into life by a vengeful witch. <laughs> Samantha was infested. I combed in aggressive yanks to remove the mats, each teeming with wiggly parasites. I told her I'm sorry, sorry for letting this happen and sorry for the painful way it must end. She purred and rubbed her chin on my leg. She moaned and writhed in pleasure at every tug. I shuddered and remembered I would make a terrible dom. <laughs> Her belly was more chitin than fur. A drowning pool was crafted, undiluted ammonia in a glass jar, and it quickly turned amber from the dissolving granules of digested blood. I used an old chopstick to emerge the soft fur into the sanguine liquid, and soon the strands wrapped around the stick, forming a wisp of Satan's cotton candy. <laughs> After hours of combing, it became apparent that Samantha was a multi-layered metropolis for the fleas. The comb could not reach the ground floor where the majority of the industrious masses congregated. This was not a problem that could be solved with chemicals and combs. The infrastructure had to be disassembled. It took all night. In the morning, my hands covered in scratches and blisters. I held my naked cat. <laughs> and I knew the horror was over. The house did not heal right away, and I did not heal it alone. My mom and friends gathered trash, pulled up forsaken carpet, and scrubbed every surface. Roommates sorted through Jason's abandoned belongings, throwing out things I never cared to see again. Deep creative purple and self-respecting bronze and restorative neon blue and friendly cheery yellow were painted over the dingy beige walls. Two adorable plump dwarf goats named Chubbins and Sergeant Horny <laughs> reversed years of disregard by gobbling the infinite tendrils of the untamed backyard. One afternoon in a patch made of fence, where a tangle of ivy had once obscured the ground, I found three small gravestones set into the clay. Tammy, 1965 to 1978, Brenda, 1974, and Princess, no dates. This property had stories I would never know, and it had survived them, but it could never completely hide them. The house feels very different now. People come here to feel safe and warm, it's more likely to smell like pizza than paint or pesticides, but I avoid the cellar. <laughs> and I haven't saved enough money to fix the hole in the bathroom. It's bandaged with heavy construction plastic, and when I take a shower, I can see through, staring into the gash at the naked, necrotic guts of this house, debrided but not healed, and the house stares back in much the same way.